Approximately 13 years ago, uh, we developed a, a system uh, to simply to try to measure the amount of residual disease after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So after six months of chemotherapy, you then have surgery, and we're just using from the general pathology, from, from the slides and organising the way we, we look at the specimen, this quantitative system called residual cancer burden. Uh, and this study is uh, a meta-analysis of 12 uh, sites from Europe and the US uh, where everybody pooled all their experience uh, with this, uh, and it's 5,000 patients, uh, to look at the uh, outcomes and to see if this is generalizable and, and how well it does work. And also, importantly, because there are four main types of breast cancer, it gives us big numbers to be able to look at each of the types to see where it works and, and what it means in the different types. The interesting thing is that after six months of chemotherapy, it's actually quite tricky to, to know where to look and to know how to report out what you find if you find any cancer. So obviously everybody's aiming for what we call a pathologic complete response, which is when we can't find any cancer, uh, having looked in the right place, uh, in, in the breast or in the lymph nodes. That's associated with an extremely good outcome. Um, but then because six months of chemotherapy can alter the tumour if there's any left in very sub substantive ways. Uh, and so this is, if it's as much a method of standardising how we section, how we approach that sort of specimen in order to have systematic uh, standardised approaches to, to reporting back to the surgeon, oncologist and the patient about what we found and putting some meaning around it. Well, we found, um, we found that it works. <laughs> we found that uh, each of these sites, many of them were, were retrospectively looking through their case records uh, to, to, to for the, from their own respective studies, and some of them were randomised clinical trials. There was a big Cancer Research UK trial that participated in this, as did um, individual sites in, in uh, Edinburgh and in Cambridge. Uh, so there was a lot of UK represent representation in, the, in this group. Um, and um, so what we found was that it works. Um, and, but the most exciting thing about what we found when we had these numbers is it's not just the category of how much there is, but the actual numerical estimate on the scale from zero to five, say 1.37 or something like that, um, that you can actually, there's a linear relationship between those numbers and the risk uh, of the disease returning. And it means we're getting to a point where you'd be able to say, ah, the value that we found has this expectation in terms of risk for an individual. Yes, event-free survival and uh, distant relapse-free survival. Um, and we, they were basically the same result. Um, so we then, for the rest of our studies, we just chose one. We chose event-free survival because that's what the FDA had used when they looked at complete response. Uh, when, when a surgery happens for, for breast surgery to remove what remains of the tumour and any lymph nodes that need to be sampled or removed, um, we look at macroscopically to try to find, and then we, which is, this is standard practice, um, but this system says identify what you think is the largest cross-sectional area and then map it to the slides that will come out so that you can reconstruct from the slides the pattern, the extent, and how much cancer there is and recreate it back to the picture. So that's the, that's the foundation of what we're doing here. So it is simply just a way of providing some structure and organisation uh, and standardisation around the way we approach the reporting of residual disease from the very moment we receive the specimen from surgery. No, um, they don't. Uh, we, we, when we first uh, reported on this at, at the ASCO meeting in 2006, and soon followed with a paper, we set up a, a, a free website. Um, so 
that people can go to the website and there are educational videos and there are illustrations and protocols and descriptions and, and you, can, you can walk through the whole process and understand it. And most importantly, the th first thing you get to is a calculator. So you can enter the data um, and, and create, uh, it, it, or the computer will automatically provide the index score and which of the four categories that index score falls into. Um, and that website is currently, it continues to grow in its usage. Um, so that website page was visited 16,000 times last month, um, which is quite a lot. I don't, th I think that it could be visited many times. People might just go there just to look. So we don't really know how often it's actually used, how many patients it directly affects, but it's quite widely used um, in, in that, from that perspective. But I think for pathology around the world, and even particularly in the US, there isn't, we're, we're really at the cusp of needing to have a standardized protocol that we say, look, this is the way we're gonna do this for everybody. We're not there yet, um, but I think this will be an important study because it's a big study and it provides it, uh, um, some, some good foundational evidence to support certain elements of what might be in that kind of template because we don't want to just make everybody collect information that's not useful. Um, so I think it's very important, uh, and, but implementation and adoption uh, will continue to be things that we're focusing on. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing that I'd like to add overall is that this came together really very efficiently and quickly with a tremendous collaborative spirit. And so the pathologists and oncologists and surgeons uh, who have you know, worked together to put this data together really took the, t the time and trouble to get as much potentially useful information provided as well so that it can be a whole portfolio of analyses and studies to ask clinically relevant questions several questions in the future uh, from this 5,000 patient meta-analysis.